So if I'm lucky, you're going to take away three things from my talk today. The first is that the corporation evolves over time. The second thing is that very small changes in the corporate code can change the world. And the third thing, which is the most relevant to, to most of you because you're about to graduate from an MBA program, is that a very small change has taken place in the corporation's code of many states in the United States that's going to have a profound effect on your careers. As Nikhil pointed out this morning, there's a paradigm shift underway in the global economic system. The current paradigm, which is maximize profit for shareholders and foist all the negative consequences of corporate behavior that you can get away with off on the commons, is about to be replaced by a new one, which is optimize profits and provide a material positive impact on society and the environment. This new paradigm, optimize good and profit, has taken hold. And this gives you all a choice. When you get out of your MBA program, you can go and perpetuate the existing paradigm, or you can join the marvelous adventure and create the new one. Your choices are going to change the world. Let me talk for a minute about my own career choices. So I'm a very unlikely person to be up here. I never meant to be a corporate lawyer. As an undergraduate, I was a studio art major. And I lived in an art studio with the smell of turpentine, tubes of paint, blank canvases, rock and roll music, the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead. And the last place I ever imagined myself was practicing law. Well, I graduated with, an, with a studio art degree. I did odd jobs. I th sold three paintings for $150 and a pair of Tony Lama cowboy boots. <laughs> and the handwriting was on the wall. I, I either had to get a credential in art, like an MFA, and teach, or by default follow in the family tradition and become the fourth generation of my family to be a lawyer. So I figured if nothing else, plan B was law school. So I applied to a couple of MFA programs, Davis, where I wanted to study with Wayne Thibault, and UC Santa Barbara, where there's a printmaker I liked. Long story short, I got rejected by the MFA programs because my portfolio was too immature. And I got into the one law school I applied to, Lewis and Clark up in Portland, which was the top environmental law school in the country. So I ended up at law school, and I almost immediately regretted my choice. <laughs> I walked into my first class, and it wasn't like Holt. I mean, you guys have a beautiful facility here. It's light, it's airy, high ceilings, lots of places to hang out. Lewis and Clark's classrooms are like Cold War bunkers. <laughs> Gray concrete, no windows, no smell of turpentine. You know, in, in the art department, I was always around the field of infinite possibilities. That certainly didn't feel like law school. Well, I ground my way through the first semester, and I hated it so much that I went in to see the dean. I said, Dean Fag, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to go figure out a way to get my MFA. I, I just can't stand this. So Dean Fag looked at me and he said, well, you can do that, John. But if, if you quit mid-year, you don't get credit for your first semester. And if you ever decide to go to law school, you'd have to repeat your first semester. <laughs> oh my god, I, that, that was a fate worse than death. He, I don't know, I, he, he, he somehow cajoled me to, to enroll for the second semester. About two weeks in, I was in the law library doing a paper, really bored. And I started wandering through the law stacks. And my curiosity got me. I started looking at these law books. And I noticed that they were arranged in chronological order. 
And I started wandering through the library, and I went deeper and deeper in time, back through the 1800s, back to the late 1700s, and then a funny thing happened. All of a sudden, the case books turned in from American ones to British ones. And it turns out that Lewis and Clark had a complete collection of English common law uh, case books going all the way back to the Magna Carta. Well, the next thing I knew, I found myself in the 1300s reading these cases about land using measurement units like rods and leagues and, and disputes about cattle and other types of wildfowl that I had no idea what they were. It was Beowulfy in English. <laughs> well, in, in that moment, I, I, I was hooked. It was like all of a sudden I had this epiphany that I wasn't just going to law school to get a gig, as my, my advisor in, in the studio art department said. I was, I was part of something. I was part of the tradition of the rule of law. And, and, and this, this discipline that I was studying went all the way back to the Magna Carta in 1215. This was just, this was amazing. Anyway, that epiphany got me through law school. I ended up graduating. I got a job. I came back to Silicon Valley. I got into law. I still hated it. <laughs> it wasn't the field of infinite possibilities. And finally, I, I got a job at a law firm where I met a fellow named Craig Johnson who ended up starting Venture Law Group. Craig was a startup lawyer. And Craig was kind of a mad professor type, disheveled hair, you know, his shirt would be untucked. And when it was off one day, he goes, John, there's these entrepreneurs, they're like Nikel. And they're, they're really enthusiastic and they're starting some new company and, and here's the file, good luck. Well, I met these entrepreneurs, I helped them start their company and I've been hooked ever since. And I've, I've had the greatest career because I get to work with a lot of really creative people and what we do is, you know, someone like Mikhail comes into my office and they tell me what their, their idea for a company is and we dream it up. We make it real. We make it happen. Well, about 10 years into this career, I started noticing that something wasn't right. And I saw that a lot of individual directors on the boards of directors of my companies on a one-on-one -on -one basis in their communities were absolutely fantastic people. They go to their church and their synagogue. They were involved in community service, doing all kinds of great things. But when you got them together in a group on the board of directors, the collective defaulted to just a, a concern about money. And, and it seemed like there wasn't any there there in the middle of this corporate entity. And I started wondering, why doesn't the corporation have a conscience? And then I asked the corollary to that question, which is, what would happen if the corporation had a conscience? And I pondered this question, and I remembered my little wander through the stacks in law school, and I started going back in history to, to look at, well, what is this? Is there a corporate conscience? And, and I discovered that Justice Brennan of the Supreme Court was wrong when he said in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission that the modern corporation has no conscience. Well, it turns out that the corporation has always had a conscience. So let's go back to the age of exploration for a moment, and let's pretend we're in 1670, and my friend Andy Gardner over here is wanting to charter the Hudson's Bay Company. Well, I'm the king. I get to play king. You guys are all of Andy's cohorts, you want to join him in the Hudson's Bay Company. How do, you, how do you form a company? Well, you come to me, I give you a charter, I give you a monopoly to exploit the Hudson's Bay watershed for the fur trade. So I've, I've endowed you with the right to be and given you a license to operate. As the king, I'm the external conscience of that entity because if Andy starts to misbehave and starts fraternizing with the French in Quebec, 
I can, I can call Andy back to London and yank the charter. And if he's really bad, I'll stick him in the Tower of London. <laughs> and I'll give the charter to Nikau. Uh, so the, the, the corporation in those times started out with an external conscience held by the king. It's very primitive. And the, and the corporation had two prime functions, go conquer foreign territory for the king and exploit that land to provide revenue for the royal treasury. That was basically the setup. So a mercantile conscience and a governmental purpose, external conscience. Well, fast forward to the American Revolution. So our founding fathers were so busy getting rid of King George and, and democrat, turning it, the, the colonies into a democracy that they never addressed the fundamental philosophical question about corporations, which is, if corporations are persons, what rights and what moral responsibilities do they have? And if you look at the Constitution and Bill of Rights, the framers were so busy getting the republic started they never asked, answered that question, with good reason. Because if, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, there were maybe 50 corporations in America. Not a big deal. Well, the baton passed to the colony, or to the new republic. And we inherited that primordial corporate architecture from England. But with one difference, instead of the external conscience function performed by the king, the early states' legislatures were that conscience function. So as strange as this may seem, in the early days of the republic, if you wanted to set up a corporation, you couldn't just go to the Secretary of State's office and, and, and fill in a paper and, and get your charter. You had to get somebody to introduce a bill in the legislature of your state. So that, and, and the legislature, if it did grant you a charter, put a very short leash on you. Typically, the, the corporation had a limited life, 10 to 20 years. And if, and there was a very prescribed purpose. And usually the purpose was a public one building a canal, building a toll road. So by the time 1800 came along, there were maybe 100 corporations in America. They weren't a big issue. Well, a funny thing happened in New York in 1811. We were having some sort of a trade dispute with England over cotton, and I think I think we were trying to build cotton mills here, capital intensive, how do you raise money for them? Somebody in New York got the bright idea, let's tinker with the corporation's code. And whoever's idea it was, was the first corporate idea virus to transform the global economic system. Because what New York did in 1811 was this two simultaneous innovations in corporations. The first was free incorporation. They had the bright idea to circumvent the legislative process so that anybody who could fog a mirror could go charter a corporation. You didn't need an act of legislation anymore. That's number one. Number two was limited liability. Until 1811, if you were a shill for the debts and obligations of that company, so if, if you held a stock certificate in a company and that company got sued or, or lost money, the creditors could come after you. These two innovations basically fueled the age of industry. industry. They spread across the world. Every country adopted limited liability corporations and made free incorporation uh, the, the norm. Now, what nobody noticed while this was happening was that basically 
killed the external conscience function performed by the legislature. So all of a sudden, you had corporations operating without any sort of social conscience whatsoever, no check and balance in the system. And with the Dartmouth College case in 1837, or something like that, uh, the, the courts removed the legislature's power to revoke the charter. So, so now we had commercial collectives without any check and balance, no social conscience whatsoever, operating in society. Now, the good news is that we got railroads and telegraphs and electric light bulbs and, and, and this freeing of capital to invest in companies unleashed untold and unimaginable human creativity. Absolutely astounding what happened. But there was a shadow side to this architecture, which is that if you look back at the last 200 years, about every 10 years or so, there's a new wave of antisocial behavior that comes from corporations. And the response is a judicial or legislative one where the, the, the courts or the legislature comes up with either new case law or new rulings to uh, address these transgressions. So we had, we had antitrust, we had monopolies in the oil business, Standard Oil, that led to antitrust laws. We had exploitation of labor, that led to laws to protect the worker. We had um, pollution, which led to Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Well, this is the dance that has been going on in the Western economy for the last 200 years. And it worked really well until we entered into, the, reasonably well until we got to the age of inter, inter, interdependence, which is where we are now, <laughs> where information moves at light speed. You know, here we are at Holt International University. You guys are an, as an international crowd. There's only 15% of your student body is from the United States. So this is the new world. It's, it's massively inter interconnected, massively interdependent. And this, this dance that we've been working doesn't work anymore. In 2008, we nearly lost the global economic system because some very intelligent people in the financial services industry created brilliant financial instruments that created such massive leverage that, that it nearly brought down the entire global economic system. And I'm not even sure we're out of the woods yet because there's still grave concerns about the health of the European economy. So what do we do? Well, I've got good news, which is that there's... Um, well, lost my train of thought here. Um, one of the things that's happening as a response to 2008, we've got, we've got Occupy, we've got the 99%. And I think what, what, the, what these movements are trying to tell the collective is that it's really time to awaken the corporate conscience. And it's, it's, it's time to, uh, it, it's, it's time that corporations, if they're going to have the rights of personhood, start to act as responsible global citizens. And I think that's really what the Occupy movement is, is, is all about. It's really, we the people really want to complete the American Revolution and get the opportunity to answer that fundamental philosophical question that the founders never answered, which is, what are the rights and moral responsibilities of our corporate citizens? So, I don't usually think of law as being poetry, but, I, but these are some of the most beautiful words, in my opinion, ever written in a code of law. They're, they're language taken from the new California Corporations Code from a 
section of the code that authorizes a new type of corporation, the California Benefit Corporation, which is one of seven states that has adopted it. This past January, we had the big bang. New York and California became the sixth and seventh state to adopt benefit corporation legislation. So Delaware better take note because this movement has legs. There are five other states that have benefit corporation legislation underway or in, in, in the legislatures. So what is benefit corporation legislation? Why is this, why is this line of corporate code so significant? Well, what, what a benefit corporation does is actually awaken the corporate conscience because the corporation is a corporation that, that voluntarily be, elects to become a benefit corporation commits itself to provide a material positive impact on society and the environment. That's a big deal, a big shift. Now remember, these are for-profit entities. So what, what the benefit corporation starts to do is activate the new paradigm and provide a, found, a legal foundation and a legal framework for businesses like Mikhail's. So it, it becomes possible to set up a business where you, you commit to optimize profit and provide a material positive impact on society. Optimize prof, good and profit. So I'm going to make you guys experts on benefit corporations very quickly. So a benefit corporation provides that material positive impact on society and environment, general public purpose. There's accountability to your shareholders. So the directors have fiduciary, fiduciary duties to not only the shareholders, but all of the corporation's stakeholders, including society and the environment. And the, the company has to measure its performance in providing a material positive impact on society and the environment against an independent third party standard. That's where the accountability comes in. And finally, we've got transparency, which is where the, uh, the company has to provide an annual report to its shareholders about how it did in terms of providing that, that public purpose. And, and the other thing it must do is provide a filing of that report on its website so it's available to the public. So uh, the other for the, for the skeptics in the crowd, and I know we have a lot of uh, financial engineers in, in an MBA program, what's really exciting about doing business this way is that it's a better business model. The early empirical financial data indicates that companies that adopt principles of sustainability in their businesses outperform their peers. There was a recent Harvard Business School paper published in November which profiled 90 companies that started adopting sustainability practices in the 1990s and compared those 90 companies against their peers. And the report showed that the sustainable companies outperformed their, their conventional peers by about 5% a year. So very significant, very significant difference. So anyway, we're at the, at the, I think we're at the dawn of a new era in the global economic system. You all are, are going to enter into the workplace soon, and you've got a choice. You've got a choice as to whether you want to perpetuate the old paradigm or create the new. You can be the change. So choose wisely because 
your choices will rock the world. Thank you.